Ladies and gentlemen, what is the chess nightmare you can't wake up from? I'll tell you what it is. It is an attack with opposite colored bishops where the queens and rooks are still on the board and the king comes under a big attack. The reason you can't wake up out of it is because with this attack on the dark squares, obviously the light squared bishop is in no position to deal with this attack. And in our game here between Kachpa Purin playing as white against Marcus Rager of Austria in FIDE World Cup 2021, we will see that a loaded computer says the position is 0, 0, 0, completely equal. In fact, it turned out to be a complete nightmare for Black as Black lost this game in just 14 more moves being knocked out of the World Cup in a big upset. Now, I'm sure you want to know how exactly did we get to this point? Well, it turns out that when you see the opening of this game, it will give you a very safe yet still quite venomous weapon against a mainline opening, the Grunfeld. If you're enjoying this video so far, do make sure to hit that like button and consider subscribing if you're new to my channel. So this game Purin against Raga, Purin being Polish GM, a, one of the top solving, uh, my top chess solvers in the world as well. We had c4, g6, knight to c3, d5. So this is the pure Grunfeld. And white plays the move knight f3, just developing the knight, keeping his options open for one more move. And then he decides to play the exchange after all with cd5, knight d5, e4, knight takes c3, b takes c3. And obviously one does not simply let white take the whole center for free. So black plays c5 hitting the center in this way. And here Purin goes for a quite interesting shortcut. Back when I was a junior, I liked to play the system with bishop to e3. And the idea of bishop b3 is that if they play queen a5 trying to attack the pawn, you can play queen to d2 and then play this up with rook c1 where we develop the queen side before the king side. And the reason is so that you have moves like d5 where for example a move like knight c6 which was a move I faced quite a lot as a club player when I was quite young. It's just not that good a move anymore because of d5 where now because bishop c3 is not winning the queen we defended it with the rook in advance with rook c1. White gets to have a very strong grip over the center, and white gets the advantage. Of course, black can play this a lot better. Nowadays, moves like knight to d7, and trying to attack this pawn are more the main trend, thanks to the efforts of top grandmasters like Ian Napomnishi, who is a big expert of the Grunfeld defense for black. But in this game, Purin plays a little bit differently. He plays the move bishop b5, which is not the most common move in the position, but it's a very safe approach. The logic is that if black were to play a move like bishop d7, it turns out that a move like even bishop takes d7 actually works quite well, because now after queen d7 castles, we see here that the attempt to attack the center with moves like cd4, cd4 and knight c6 can just be met with bishop e3. And it turns out to be a big advantage that we already traded the light squared bishops, because black doesn't have the move bishop g4 to pin our knight and pressure this pawn. Therefore, we're able to move our rook, play d5 to push our central majority forward, and that's going to give us quite a nice advantage. Whereas by comparison, let's say we played bishop e2 instead. Well, black can then go knight c6, and now we see it after bishop e3 and bishop g4. Well, we don't have this move at d5 anymore because our c3 pawn is hanging. So we see that the trade of the light squared bishops actually works in white's favor here. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that the move bishop e2 is also not so bad, kind of saying that knight c6 that you're not having to worry about the pressure on d4 because you've already, well, because the bishop is in the way. But okay, both moves are going to give white some advantage here. The better move for black is the one Raga played with knight to c6, Raga being known as Austria's top player and also a big theoretician. White played the move castles, realizing that black is not really threatening to take d4 because the knight is still pinned to the king. But after castles, now the threat to the pawn does become real. So white plays a move bishop e3 defending the pawn. Bishop to g4 was played, putting the pressure here. And you also notice that black is not rushing to play c takes d4 because if white does play d takes c5, it might look like a pawn grab. But a, black can play bishop takes c3 and get the pawn back. And b, you're kind of destroying your own center, which is not really ideal here. Uh, so either way, it's not really a great outcome for white. So instead of playing this or playing some move like d5, leading some complex play, 
White plays the main move, bishop takes c6, and after b takes e6 and rook c1. The idea of rook c1 is that now white wants to be able to put some pressure down that c file later, in that, well, black is probably going to take on d4 at some point, right? And then after cd4, it helps that we have the pressure against the pawn on c6, which is an isolated pawn. So this is one extra pawn island that black has compared to white. Now, to be fair, black does have the bishop pair in return. So that means that we're moves such as queen d7 or queen to a5, that the position is still very much playable for black. He does, after all, have some decent pressure against that d4 pawn, as is usual for the Grunfeld. But I guess why can argue that his position is practically quite safe, that he can play for a win without really taking any major risk, which I think is what Purin was aiming for, this very safe. Two results, it's most likely to be a draw, but I have some small chances to win without any chances to lose. In the game, Black played the move Queen A5, which is actually, I think, one of the better moves in the position, perhaps along with the move Rook B8. And, well, the idea is to pressure this pawn on, uh, on A2. So I defend it with Queen C2, which at first glance might seem like a bit of a weird decision because it does allow Black to double the white pawns around the king with Bishop takes F3, G takes F3. But with the Black Queen being a long way from the white king, Black's not really in a great position to attack that white king. Now, to be fair, Black probably is still doing okay if he plays f5 and tries to create some pressure against the center or maybe bring the f file, uh, open the f file for the rook to enter the attack. So, to be fair, Black's probably still doing okay here, but I mean, it's a position that probably both sides can be happy with their chances. Uh, definitely, it's a position where the unbalanced structure gives some scope for the better player to win. Uh, the game instead saw Black play bishop e6, which I think is a little bit imprecise. I think that Black wanted to keep his bishop pair advantage alive and try to pressure the isolated pawn on a2. But if White had played a move like a4, it would be very hard for Black to meaningfully attack the pawn. I guess rook b8 is one idea, trying to go bishop c b3 and trying to win the pawn with the fork. But White can cover it with rook b1, and I think you can make a decent argument that basically White's better pawn structure is probably a little more important than Black's bishop pair. Also, white does have a nice space advantage, which also does a good job of constricting black's bishops. So it's close to equal, but I give white a very small pull here. In the game, white played c4, which to be fair is also a reasonable move. You know, if white can get in d5, he'll certainly have a very nice space advantage. And the pawn on c5 could also become a target then, you know, to something like knight d2, b3 after pawn to d5 would be one way to take advantage of the new structure. So that's why black is right to play cd4. And after knight d4, again, it's a position where basically the best move for black is to play bishop d4 as he did and give up the bishop pair. And that might seem like a very unnatural decision because it is true that, like we saw at the start of this video, that the black king does look quite open. But black always has a move like f6 in the worst case to block that long diagonal. So I think that his king should be reasonably all right if black were to play correctly. Whereas by comparison, if black does try to keep the bishop pair with a move like bishop d7, defending the pawn as well as retreating the bishop. The problem with that is that the bishop is very passive, and white can play knight b3, and just have a very beautiful outpost on c5 for the knight, where it oversees the entire queen side. White can then fight very well for the control of the open files, and with both of the black bishops kind of hitting thin air, white would have a very nice advantage here. So the move bishop takes d4 was played, and after rook fd8, honestly, the position is just equal. A move like rook fd1 would be one approach. But I guess that white realized that it would allow a trade of some rooks that would bring the game closer to a draw. So Purin says, well, let's keep the pieces on the board. It's not as though black has a real entry point down the d file or the b file anyway. So let's keep the pieces on the board. Maybe keep the option of f4, f5 to attack their king later. And let's see what happens. Black played rook a b8. White played the move h3, just making some look for the king, and also, again, realizing that it's not as though black is really threatening to invade down the b file. A uh, move like rook b4, for example, would be quite a big mistake, because now we have a little tactic, bishop d2, and that's going to win the exchange with the pin. So now we see why black plays queen a6. He wants to prepare rook b4 without allowing the bishop d2 pin. In retrospect, though, maybe a move like f6 might be more precise, which just kind of shuts off this attack and just keeps that black king very safe. Also, as a general principle, it's usually a good idea to place your pawns on the opposite color complex to your remaining bishop, so that the black pawns can do a good job of constricting 
the white unopposed dark squared bishop, much in the same way that white's pawns on the light squares are constricting the light squared bishop of black. In fact, it sort of reminds me of a quote by Boris Spassky, where Spassky was once asked about his first marriage, and he said, my wife and I were like opposite colored bishops. Anyway, having pondered this little metaphor, let's now see how the game went. We had queen to a6, and I really like the move that white played here. He played the move of bishop c5, not just stopping rook b4, but also getting at that slight weakness on e7. And merely after rook b7, still the position is about equal, but the momentum is slowly shifting just a tiny bit in white's favor. And with the move rook fd1, we see white continuing to fight hard for the initiative. We had rook takes d1, queen takes d1, and black's not really in a position to take either of these pawns yet. For example, if he plays queen a2, this would actually be quite suicidal. And it shows us the power of the unopposed uh, bishop, or rather the opposite colored bishops for the side that has the attack. And why, when it comes to opposite colored bishops, if you have an opposite colored bishop ending with just the bishops, pawns, and kings on the board, then those endings do have a very drawish tendency, more so than virtually any other type of ending. But add the queens on the board, and suddenly the picture is very different. Bishop takes e7, and suddenly queen f8 is a checkmating threat. And black doesn't really have a good answer to it. The black king is coming under a big attack, and giving up the exchange is not really going to save you the game for black here either. But unfortunately, there's nothing better at this point. So black plays queen a5, making sure there are no entry points down the file, kind of like we saw white do a little bit earlier. And you attack the bishop, which is always nice. So white plays queen d4, again realizing that, again, black is not threatening to take on a2 yet. So black plays a move rook d7 uh, to take the file and attack the queen, a very natural move. Uh, if you want to avoid the next move, you could also play f6 and just take away that e5 square from the queen. Because it's not like white has a big threat. In a move like e5, in the worst case, you can block and just shut down, out any attack along this, uh, well, along this uh, long diagonal, as it were. So after rook d7, we had queen e5, and now black found a very good defensive move. The principle being that if you're coming under an attack, one of the best ways to defend often is to trade off the opponent's best attacking pieces. In this case, it's a white queen. So well done if you found queen c7, offering a swap of queens. Now the ending would just be very equal and would be of a very drawish tendency. Granted, when you have the rooks on the board, it does create some scope to outplay the opponent. These endings are normally not that drawish in reality. But the fact that both sides bishops are attacking one another's pawns and tying up the rook to the defense means it's just very hard for either side to make any meaningful progress here. White instead plays queen g5, which objectively is not better or worse than queen c7, but we can say that black's king is just a little bit more exposed than white's king. And the way the game played out does show this was correct, the correct practical decision. Black played the move queen b7. Uh, again, I would probably go f6. I'm not entirely sure why. Black decided not to push this pawn. I understand the principle that you don't want to push the pawns if it weakens your king, but it actually makes your king safer to cover the dark squares. And also it helps your king get more active for an end game when the queens eventually come off. So queen b7, white plays bishop e3, you know, perhaps eyeing up some bishop h6 one day. Again, a little surprising that black doesn't go f6 to kick the queen and control the dark squares. I know I sound like a broken record, but that's one of the main defensive lessons from this video of how black should have played it instead. Because if he had played f6, I don't think he would have lost this game, honestly. But he goes queen b2, and this is where I think things start to go a little bit awry for black. Because it turns out you can actually ignore the attack on the a2 pawn, because we have bigger fish to fry. Uh, so the key move here for white is... So this is your chance to try to find the answer if you want to challenge yourself a little bit. Uh, and also you can always write in the comments below what you move you would play, what you think of the game. Always love hearing your thoughts and I do try to get back to each and every one of you. Uh, so the game sort of move queen to c5. It's not the only good move. If you want to defend your pawn, that would also be perfectly fine. But I like queen c5 because you're attacking this weak pawn. You're keeping an eye on these guys. And probably black's best move here is to admit his mistake and just play queen to b7. Now, granted, white is still better. He can play moves like a4, and he can try to fix that a7 pawn as a weakness. Not to mention, he can also try to switch over to attack the black king later. So it's not as easy to defend as the engine's uh, almost equality assessment makes it out to be. 
But we best play Black can defend this, uh, this situation. It's not that bad for him yet. But instead, Queen takes h2 is a move that really is asking for trouble. And in fact, I think White's move probably isn't actually the best one. To this point, White's played a more or less perfect game, I think, uh, if we discount not playing the most critical opening. But I think that's not a decision we should criticize. But this was the first point where we could improve a little bit on White's play. Because White decides to grab the pawn with Queen takes c6. Which is a very natural move, and admittedly, Black didn't manage to find the right defense. So the decision did pay off for him very well in the game. But one thing to keep in mind when you are attacking with the opposite colored bishops and the queens on the board is that the initiative and the attack on the king is going to be more important than the material in principle. So it turns out that the move queen e5 is actually more annoying. And the idea of queen e5 is that you're simply threatening to play bishop to h6 and checkmate with the queen on g7. And black doesn't have the move f6 to defend because then the bishop would be hanging. And that's why the queen is a lot better on e5 than on c6 to both hit the bishop and threaten the mate on g7. So to defend, black has to play to move rook d6, so that he can meet bishop h6 with f6, and keep that bishop defended. But it turns out now to move bishop g5 is just very strong. The idea being that you can't really play f6, because white just takes it and the pawn is overloaded. You can't really take the bishop, because then you lose the rook, and it's just all a disaster piece for black. But instead, if you play a move like queen a3, which is the injured's idea to meet bishop c7 with queen c1 and, you know, get the, uh, the attack on the rook or to take the rook with check. But white has other moves he can play, like rook a1 is one possibility uh, in this position. Uh, the computer thinks that this is only slightly better for white, which is a little bit surprising to me. Granted, I'm using Komodo, which is nowhere near as strong as uh, Stockfish, but it's also an engine that doesn't freeze non-stop on me. So we stack a little bit of objective quality of analysis to give you a better viewing experience. So if we do take bishop e7, if you're wondering what on earth the idea is to give up the rook with check, the answer is that you're threatening to take the rook. And if they do play some move like rook to d7, then we've got queen b8, and this is white's idea. The black can't actually save the rook because we got the queen f8 and mate. That you may recall from an earlier variation if you've been paying attention. So therefore black basically has to give up the rook and let's say he plays a move like h6 just so that a later check is not going to be mate. You create a hidey hole. You know, white I think is quite significantly better after bishop d6. The material might be equal but after say queen g5 this is to avoid some queen f6 bishop e5 mating net. Well white's definitely got the advantage here because black's king is a lot more exposed White has a much better bishop. They can even anchor with a move like c5 if needed. So black would still have a long defensive task ahead of him to draw the game. With best play, it's probably holdable, but in a practical game, it's definitely a situation where black can easily go wrong and where I think that a stronger player does have a very good chance of winning with the white pieces. Well, instead, white played the move queen takes c6. And again, this is where black made a decisive mistake at this moment. This is not an easy defensive puzzle, of course, when you analyze a lot with engines, it can be easy to think, oh yeah, it just looks easy, but in an actual game, of course, it's a bit different. So what would be your move as black? Uh, if you're not an advanced player, you might struggle a little bit with this one. After all, a 2680 rage champ did not manage to find the best move as black, even with a lot of time on the clock. At least I assume he had a lot of time, because there's a classical time control and it's move 27. So it would kind of surprise me if he was in big time trouble at this point. So, in the game, black played a5, which turns out to be a decisive mistake. What black had to do here is he really had to trade off some of white's attacking firepower. And the way to do that is to move queen to b3. And the idea of queen b3 is to go rook d1 and basically trade off the rooks, which does sort of help to safeguard your king in a way. For example, if white were to play, let's say, a move like uh, c5, for example, pushing his past pawn. Well, black is in time to play a move like rook to d1 get those rooks off the board, and then offer a trade of queens with queen to d7. Uh, and I mean, the opposite colored bishop ending would be an ironclad draw, even if black lost to pawn, it would still be a dead draw. White can do better with queen a8, and maybe this is something that black might have been a little bit nervous about, that this past c pawn looks very dangerous. But actually, it turns out that even though this pawn looks like it's queening, that black does manage to get just enough counterplay with the move of queen d3, which is hitting that pawn on e4. And if white plays a move like c7, black can just play queen to d6 and, well, either take the pawn or he has a, 
a draw by repetition if the king moves back. But okay, it's basically just a draw here uh, once these pawns get traded. So it turns out that, yeah, with this pawn kind of falling, you know, if white does try to keep the queens on the board, say he plays a move like queen e8, for example, then yeah, this again looks very, very scary, but you've got c7 and queen e5. And if queen to e7, it turns out that it looks very scary. It looks like there's going to be some sort of mating attack on the king, and I guess queen t6, bishop d4 would be an example of that kind of mating attack. But it turns out with the cold-blooded move, bishop d5, the black manages to basically either force to trade a queens because of the mate threat, and that ending with queen e4, it just ends up being basically just a draw, where the extra pawn is just completely meaningless, and black has a, a very clear fortress on the light squares. White is never going to break through this. Uh, I mean, you could almost give white a pawn on b6, and it probably would still be a draw with the light squared fortress. So that's how black could have saved the game. Of course, it's true, white can play other moves, but in you know, a move like king h2, maybe if you really want to anticipate rook d1. But in principle, black is holding at this point. And it's not, I think, incredibly difficult once you see queen b3, because the moves can almost find by a process of elimination of, okay, all these other moves are bad, so I have to try this move, which is not clearly bad, as it were. But in the game, the move a5 was played, and this is just asking way too much, and in some ways shows a lack of sense of danger from black, I guess he just had some kind of blackout and missed the winning move for white, which is... Can you guys find the move that Purin played to nail the win? Okay, it turns out we can use a little bit of geometry with the queen and the bishop, and by going for the attack on the king, exploring black's weak back rank and the weakness of the dark squares, that we can immediately win the game. That was my hint for you. The answer is that the move bishop h6 is an absolute killer. Technically, queen b5 is also winning, but this basically wins the game on the spot. Uh, after the move, rook d8, which is kind of necessary to make sure you're not getting mated by queen c8 or by queen e8. Well, white just played queen c7, and black resigned here because, obviously, there's a threat of checkmate against the rook. But if you defend the rook, let's say you play rook e8 to defend the pawn, then the danger comes from another angle. And I think the move that Raga missed probably in his calculations was this queen e5. And either you play queen g7, mate, or they play f6 and you take the bishop and... Okay, it turns out you're kind of checkmating anyway, but an extra bishop is certainly enough here. So yeah, from this game you can see the nightmare that can befall you if you are in a position with opposite colored bishops, where the queens are still on the board, and you are facing the attack or facing an initiative. Because it turns out you can't wake from this nightmare that we see here, because, well, we see that the light, that the light squared bishop... Is just useless in dealing with the uh, with the attack, as I forget how to highlight squares. But you see, this bishop is absolutely useless in fending off the attack on the dark squares, and white is able to make a severe flow of freights that black was ultimately unable to resist. So you guys now know to avoid that nightmare. If you enjoyed this video, do make sure to smash that like button, and as I said before, you're always welcome to subscribe uh, for more of my Grandmaster Chess videos. That will not only improve your chess, but allow you to enjoy your chess a lot more as well. So that being said, I look forward to reading your comments as well. I try to reply to each one, and I will see you in the next video. Get out of here.